All right. This is the June 14 special meeting of the Groton Planning and Zoning Commission. It is a workshop format, so the public will not have the opportunity to address the commission. Staff tonight uh, is Paige Bronk, John Reiner, and Deb Jones. And Jeff Pritchard is the chair. No, no recorder? I don't think so. All right, so I'll call the uh, special meeting of the Planning and Zoning Commission to to order. Roll call looks like Barbara is not present. She wasn't sure if she was going to be able to make it. But I see everybody else is here. Okay, well, we... The next item is uh, our work... Old business, which is our workshop for Mystic Education Center zoning text amendment. And did John have some, something to say to us before we start? Yes, please. Good evening, everybody. John Reiner, Director of Planning and Development Services. Uh, thanks for coming along. So I just wanted to kind of set a little bit of a framework and start kind of the general discussion and understanding for how we want to move forward. So, you know, Deb and I have been kind of going back and forth a little bit about what is the best way to kind of move this entire um, item forward with the zoning regulations. And, um, you know, we don't have a formal application yet. We look at this soon becoming a town application for a zoning text amendment. And something that came up uh, recently, I did just want to kind of remind everybody and put on everyone's radar once again that although – we don't have a formal even town application to create a zoning text amendment. We all just need to be aware of any conversations or correspondence that we get outside of planning and zoning commission meetings um, because we want to make sure that any conversations about this project or about the zoning, if it's indications or things that people are asking people outside of meetings, have them reference it to a, an email to staff to the commission so it all becomes part of the record. We just want to make sure that any information that's coming anyone's way is all part of the public record and that there's no um, concerns about ex parte communication or anything like that outside of meetings. So I just want to make sure, you know, I know sometimes uh, we might sound like we're beating a dead horse on that one, but it's always something that we're just cognizant on with uh, all of our applications. So um want to kind of put that out there. So, Wanted to go briefly through, and I think kind of some of the format we're uh, thinking about tonight, uh, it's talking with the chair, you know, looking at just the general direction moving forward. Uh, the chair had put together a nice memo on discussion topics and, you know, the workshop objectives. But one of the main points that, you know, Deb and I have been contemplating with this based on the last meeting that we had with the commission is, Really, how is the best way to move forward? And I think we have this general direction, but I, I kind of want to ask a few um, opening questions to get a little bit of direction. And really the first one is, does everybody on the commission think that the zoning on the property should be changed? And if so, how should we do that? So, you know, before we kind of continue down the path we were going before, there might be a, a fork that we have to take, or maybe we need to kind of stop in the road that we're on a little bit. And you know, I just want to make sure we're, we're going in the right direction. Great question. Are we going to go one by one down the commission on this one, um, Chair? Oh, what I wanted. Did you have anything more to say, John? Or? Well, I, I wanted to kind of, you know, mm -hmm. should the zoning be changed? Looking at the memo that I put together, some of them, it goes along um, not exactly hand-in-hand hand with the outline that uh, the chair had put together, but I think a lot of it they kind of blend well together. You know, the first couple of pieces about the zoning, if you want to change the zoning, the type of process we do with that, is it utilizing existing zoning or new zoning text? Talk a little bit about floating zones and the context, like what a floating zone does and why – if we go in a new direction, that might be the best way to go. And then, you know, talk a little bit about that process and then kind of the parameters of a new zoning district development stages and then kind of next steps from there. So that's what we were hoping to get out of tonight a little bit. Not necessarily should the 
height be X or should it be Y? But setting the framework a little bit more again, kind of taking a big step back to make sure we're getting some consistent uh, feedback from the commission, as well as going through those discussion to- topics that the chair had put together. All right. Okay. So oh, to get back to, to the process, I did lay, lay out what I thought were uh, an organization of the topics to, to discuss since it's sort of wide open area. And I thought the best way would be to take the major issues and try to get uh, people's thoughts of, you know, looking at the thing at a 10,000 foot level and not to down in the weeds and go down our usual order, which is I just use the uh, the, gen- the uh, listing of uh, personnel as the as the order. There's nothing special about that, uh, and try to make sure everybody's or sort of has an understanding of what we're talking about. And then start talking about uh, what are potential uses for the property. You know, starting off with almost a clean slate, and eventually getting down to to more details of what the uh, pro- what the development would uh, would look like. <clears throat> so I thought to start off, it would be good to just sort of have a brief understanding of what the property is we're talking about. You know, the, the size of the property is 48. There are two actual state properties. One is, I think, 240 Oral Hill Road, and the other is 8 Oral Hill Road, I believe it is. But the big one is a 240. That's a 40-acre site, and the other one's on the other side of Oral Hill Road is just under uh, eight acres. And looking at some of the the constraints we have is that road access is sort of limited based on it's off of uh, Oral Hill Road, which is a fairly narrow rundown uh, access way. However, it, we, it does have good access from a close proximity to the uh, interstate uh, interchange at exit 89. Also interesting to note is the only road access is really north and south. There's no no east and west access to the property. Adjacent properties, uh, they're mainly uh, residential on on three sides and on the river side it's open space. Uh, They're Existing buildings on the property, two main ones that are them exist. Uh, there's also uh, a waste disposal area that has to be taken care of. There's a big pond on it. The buildings are sort of run down. Um, and from the, say, southern part, eastern part of the property, you have some pretty good views down the river, maybe through tree leaves now, but uh, it is possible because it's up so high to to see down, all the way down into uh, the village itself. I don't know if anyone has any other thoughts on important uh, attributes of the property that we should identify. If they do, uh, you can bring them out now. And the next uh, thing I think is the important part is to start talking about potential uses for the property. That it may not want to be limited just to residential uses, but maybe specific types or mixed uses or certain other other uh, uses that could be done of the property. And I here, I think we ought to try to bring out as many uh, uh, opportunities as, as we can think of so we don't miss anything that might turn out to be uh, a good use. 
rather than just trying to limit it. Now, so with that, I like to uh, I'll start with Michael Kane, and just to go over what he thinks, and just go over what you think are potential uses at sort of a general description. I don't think we have to get down to real details, but just general types of of items, and then later in the process we'll go down to maybe some of the parameters we want to uh, or limits we want to put on the, the development. So I'll start with you, Mike. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I'll try to address some of these things, and I, I'm excited to hear what other people are going to say. So I might want to contribute a little bit more after I hear more. But I, I think I'll just try to answer some of the questions that have been raised. And uh, that how I feel at this point, I'm, I'm, sorry, I'm glad that we're like, you know, if we could start with a clean slate, that would be great. But I think that we need to or that we can't, at least for me, ignore the current zoning that is there now. Um, I, I think that would be, uh, I think we'd be remiss to do that. I, I recognize that there are institutional buildings there, and there have been institutional buildings there historically, that the town has used those, and that uh, if they, those can be used, uh, <laughs> I would be okay with that. Whether or not they can, that would have to be determined at a, you know, whether it's cost effective or, uh, practical. Um, certainly the site is a good location. I think, um, I have more questions than I have answers. And as far as attributes go, I, you know, you've got a pretty level, uh, surface to work with there, which is rare in New England. Um, I, you know, I, I, I would like to think that um, maybe there could be some residential houses in a place like this. Uh, you know, single family homes or two family homes. I think that that would be appropriate for an area like this. And I think it would be consistent with what is already in that area. How many and, uh, you know, um, how dense it is. I, I'd like to hear what other people have to think. Leave it at that for now. That is a good point on the on the zoning regulation that we can leave it just as it is, which is RU80. But uh, I'll move on to uh, Hal. No, I'll, I'll go the same way. We should be. I'll be able to say my bit and then be quiet, so we'll keep going around and around on this. But I wouldn't mind actually starting by. One thing I think we should discuss is stepping back even farther, take the observation balloon up a little higher than we're thinking. We're, right now we're saying, okay, let's just step out and look at a clean slate. But we actually just finished a town-wide plan of conservation and development for the whole town. And so one of the things we need to take into consideration is how we want to have the town develop with regards to this. Um, we, we keep talking about where downtown is, and we've got some other other nodes. And are we do we really want to change that right now, or do we think the path we were on and have a manual on right now is defunct and want to change it? I just say that because in round terms, I forget who posted it. It turns out. Exactly how many people are aware is not exactly what we thought it was. Mystic, both sides of Mystic Groton side is almost the exact same size as the city of Groton in terms of population. Who would have thought? Um, do we want to fight against that? I, I doubt it. Um, that doesn't even include what we call downtown Groton, which has just, uh, I came up with, it has about uh, 1,700 residents in 700 units in that area. Um, it also has three grocery stores and a couple um, pharmacies and any number of other things that Mystic and the city of Groton don't even have. So I don't know what we, how much we want to just change and should keep, a, keep an eye out for just skipping over that and coming up with something yet new. I'm kind of a little uncomfortable with coming up with something brand new. 
Um, in terms of what the zoning is, that's with so much stuff, the zoning is based on what was. Big open space. It was a big open space because the, the state owned it and didn't do anything with it. And we're thankful for that. Um, but I don't, <coughs> don't want to do anything that's counter to the adjacent zoning as opposed to what the zoning is there. Uh, that scares me a little bit less just because one thing that keeps slipping on most of the things that all the graphics that we keep seeing is how much of that area of town is not available for development. It's, yes, a great big developable area, a cleared area you see, plus a little bit more and everything to the west of it. No matter what we're talking about developing, an enormous chunk of the town on that corner is still going to be open space, no matter what we have. Because the state isn't even turning it over. We're, we're, that's a good thing. So I'm, I'm okay with really rethinking the zoning. That's where the oral school is and to the left of it. But I'm not thinking at this point based on what the entire town looks like. Changing it dramatically from anything that already exists in that area. It's opportunities. I understand that because it's a flat site. If it was a farm there, we'd say, great, it's a flat site. It doesn't mean, it doesn't make it any closer to a grocery store. There is none there. It doesn't make it any closer to a, uh, in fact, it's almost three miles to drive to a grocery store in that location. It's not a good location for many residences. They completely car dependent. And we should envision that. Yes, you can put a couple little convenience things in there, fine. But that's not the bulk of it. Everyone's going to be jumping into the car. Um, this route, we have that building that people keep talking about the, historically. You have a pool, you must have a gym if it's cost effective, which we can't lean on. I know that's one of the major drivers of this is maybe we get a free pool out of this. It's not free. And as I understand, in fact, we'd actually be leasing it after the end. So it's not even close to being free. To the historic buildings, I don't know. If, I'd like to hear if anybody else thinks they're historic. Just old. Big old buildings. They'll cost many, many millions just to clean up. And then we might end up with something that we're very, very difficult to use. So I'm not even that keen on necessarily keeping it unless there's some piece, bits and pieces that end a little extra flavor to it. I don't know if there's any people here in the, I have a connection to the deaf community. I really personally do not so much as my daughter have an affinity for sign language and then ended up with a little bit of it. And the oral school here was actually unique in being reviled by most of the deaf community because they did not want kids to learn how to use sign language and therefore they're mostly no, cut off. They, these, this school didn't want them to use sign language. They wanted them to only use lip read, which is very ineffective for deaf people, unfortunately. They didn't want to give them the choice. So this was the school that went the wrong way and they finally got out of it because it just kind of fell out of favor. So it's not a great thing that started a great movement. It was actually sort of, sort of a misstep and wasn't the only school. It wasn't the only anything. It just was a school that taught the system. So uh, we've all done the tour of it, and it's just a big old building, I think, as far as most of us are concerned, occupying a pretty nice site. Uh, I kind of agree with Michael that maybe it could be used for other things. But I'm not quite sure what because of its lack of services. There's no gas station up there. There's just nothing that's there that makes it a good place to put too many residences. Kind of the basis for housing is you put the people where the things are. And here there's no things. We'd have to come up with things. And we're not going to have critical mass. You get to see yet another 2,000 people, 1,000 people. I don't know what the right number is having to get into their cars to drive to make it to McQuaid's as the only grocery store to get there. Next person talk now. 
That's about my, my general feeling. But I, I do want to make sure we, we keep the, the entire map of the town in mind rather than just focusing on, on this one little opportunity. It's kind of our job to do that. As opposed to when somebody makes an application, well, it was their lot. Well, I don't want us to make the, the same the same mistake and just think of this lot. This is a piece of the town. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, so. Thanks. Um, in looking at this, I, mean, I agree with Michael and Hal said, <clears throat> and I think um, that's how really things are set up. I mean, our plan of conservation and development, the POCD, as it's known, and our regulations are clear, they're protective, and they're consistent. And starting with the POCD and what this says, of course, it says the area is sensitive to development, the area of oral, the oral school. And as we know, a large project was not contemplated in the POCD. <clears throat> as you can see on map D-11, the full build out. Um, in the map conclusion dash one future land use, the POCD marks the area as government facilities, institutional and infrastructure. So, um, to me, you almost have to consider changing the POCD or loosening it up or something to allow, for one thing, for the public to have input on what should this area look like? Because when we had that before, they came up with a different answer than what's being contemplated here. <clears throat> and we would potentially amend the zoning regulations to reflect these changes, again, allowing for public input. But, okay, moving from that, I think the current zoning regulations, and this was quoted before by Steve, I think, <clears throat> it's good to remember um, that the protective part of them and consistent part are right in section 1.1 of the purpose to promote the health, safety, um, RU80 zoning as rural residential and meant to accommodate on family dwellings, agriculture, and related activities and other lower density uses. <clears throat> so uh, to me, given this is what we have, the POCD and our zoning regulations, and there's a consistency there, um, and we don't have any other concrete information, as you would perhaps expect, <clears throat> such as they had in the Perkins Farm, which is a similar type, I think, development, a different development for a large property. Um, but they had a plan. They talked with the neighbors. They had a very concrete um, drawing of all this. They knew how many units. They knew what kind of buildings and uses. Um, we don't have this, but we do have our existing zoning that we can work from. And I think we should first really look at the RU80 zoning and see um, what what could be done. I mean, when it was constructed, it was constructed so it is consistent with the neighborhood zoning. Um, and um, so I think... For example, you know, the setbacks and all that, the whole details of that zoning make it so it doesn't stand out like a sore thumb from the neighborhoods around it. Um, I did ask uh, the town staff to prepare a map so I had an idea of what the oral school actually covered land-wise. Uh, I was just curious about both what we see now for the buildings and what has been torn down. And in fact, it was, um, it seems to me that the coverage they had there with those large buildings, at least area wise, would have been consistent with the RU80 uh, zoning. Um, but um, for the buildings themselves, um, as they are, I agree with Hal that the buildings are just old, they're not a story. And because builders sometimes can come up with terrific ideas, even for things that are old and not historic, we need something concrete uh, that spurs everybody to think about the possibilities. Um, so whatever the builder um, under something that's um, 
in compliance with our regulations as is or as adjusted, uh, that would be an important first step. Um, I think, uh, let's see what else I want to say. I, I think there's a lot when you look at the details of what's allowed in this particular zone. There are a lot of general things um, that could certainly work with some of the people that were interested in developing the site, some of the other um, people, and maybe the current one that there's an agreement with. But I think that's, I don't know how you would start anywhere else than with what you have. So. That's all I have for now. Thank you. Stay. It's a both mute here. Um, I like John's question in the beginning that was asking um, kind of the fundamental question, if we would change anything if this developer never showed up, and I don't think we would, based on a lot of the stuff that Sue just said. Um, you know, this was not in the POCD. And it certainly wasn't something that was screaming at us that, um, you know, we've had other places in town that actually do scream, you know, on, uh, I think it was 117. You know, we were always looking at that property and there were various developers that came in and they said that this is, uh, you know, this is uh, a place that development should take place because it had easy access. Um, you know, it checked all the right boxes for having easy uh, car access. It wasn't near residential. Um, it was already zoned properly. This, unfortunately, I, I don't think checks any of the boxes in terms of screams, um, you know, I want more development. So um, based on your, your question about what we would consider uh, good uses, you know, first, First and foremost, you know, residential, but that would, you know, I would certainly be uh, agreeable to expanding that to assisted living and, uh, you know, various facilities like that. Um, you know, small medical facilities, I think, would be good for that, which would not generate, you know, tre tremendous amount of traffic. Um, R&D centers we had talked about, you know, a small little, uh, you know, research centers and I know that these spring up in various places, but, you know, some kind of unification. And actually, um, who, who was there before in one of the buildings? Um, get the name. It was a technology company. Yeah, I, I, I forget, but they were leasing space in one of the buildings there for a That's while. Right. Um, and then, uh, you know, data centers, which, again, you know, are propping, popping up all over the place. So I think there's plenty of good uses that, you know, could use a piece of property that would have minimal impact on the surrounding areas, still be, you know, tax tax revenue, maybe not a school, but, I mean, certain other facilities would certainly be tax generators and, um, and, and wouldn't have the, the negative impacts. Uh, above all, you know, your problem is going to be that, if you get into a big project, you're going to fundamentally change what's going on in a big portion of town, and there's no going back. And I certainly would want to err on the side of cautiousness on, on uh, making any changes to the zone to the zone that would open the door to a lot of development uh, that we don't have control of. Then. That's up. I'm sure. So, um, like a lot of the other uh, commissioners, I went back um, to some templates and some history here, and I started um, similar to what Sue brought up um, and others on the district um, plan of, cons of conservation. And um, I believe <laughs> that since we have already set that template, anything we do to change that template needs a process redo. It doesn't need a floating zone redo. I believe we need to go back to the town of Broughton and say, tell me fundamentally, is our plan of, conver of conservation wrong? And, and is that why we're doing this? And I believe that there needs to be very significant um, citizen input in order to make um, a change um, to this particular zone, because, like others, 
Um, I don't see and to answer part of John's question. There's no problem with the current zoning up there. There's no need, in my opinion, for um, dramatic change. And I haven't um, seen anything yet why we need development other than, up there other than um, a nice effort by the state of Connecticut to move a piece of property um, forward. Um, but at the same time, um, I, I visited it um, just this week to, to really look at the buildings and sort what Hal said, to say, you know, and I believe there was an editorial about this in a local newspaper, um, how important are those um, brick buildings, you know? And they're not historic. It's not downtown Mystic. It's not another fire district like Noang. It's a nice old building. In my belief, if we choose to move forward to a floating zone, which I'm not opposed to, but the first embrace is the mission of the town, the whole town, the people who live around it, the citizen input that the town must garner first if we're going to change the, the plan of, of conservation. There are a couple of really good zoning changes in our particular area that actually Stonington did. And as Sue referenced um, Perkins Farm, which I was um, very involved with from, from the very start, um, the Greenway development, you know, created a townwide embrace of that particular property. But it was created prior to that property being built. And if you all know, you know, what's going to do with the Greenway development, Section 7.23, um, they got concurrence by a town to embrace a major change to what they did in their plan of conservation. And if we believe, which I'm on the edge of it, because I don't believe in historic buildings, is that the mill building, whatever up there, we'll take a look at what Stonington did with their heritage um, mill, um, which is 4.10 in their um, conservation. It allows a lot of flexibility, what m m must be done, but it's not an afterthought. It's not like I'm going to get something free. It becomes part of the community, like the velvet mill. So I potentially could see something like that, which I believe Stonington has done a great job with the velvet mill. And I think they've done a great job with Perkins Farm. So something that is very planned, as Steve brought up, that is part of the whole, I would support a great deal. But if you're not talking to the neighbors and we think we're going to make a, a dramatic change of, of the RU80 zone, that doesn't appear to be part of the mission of this commission nor of, of Mystic. That's it for me, John. Okay. I was looking at some sp more specific potential uh, uses for the property because it is one of the few large large areas that's available for development. And there might be other, I just thought there might be other uses than just pure adding to some of the housing stock. And in, in the past, people have expressed concern over the, the changes in the po population with a town and that it's aging in that it might be useful to have uh, housing developed for an aging population, senior housing or, or perhaps something that uh, has su support, su uh, life support housing for elderly people, uh, that type of thing. It might be, I was wondering whether you could put a, a boutique hotel there, a small hotel might be different, but there's so many other facilities like that around here. There's probably no advantage to doing that. You could put a convention center in, but again, it might generate too much traffic. Whatever we do, it it has to take the traffic uh, development concern seriously because it it's just not realistic to try to put something in that requires a lot of uh, traffic going in and out of a of the facility. You know, and you could have some small mixed use in there, I guess, that the local neighborhood might support. You do have uh, convenience stores that aren't too far away up on 184 from Cow Hill. 
road. Uh, those types of things. And that you might consider that maybe RU80 is is maybe too limiting. That some of that thought was there, I, I believe, because of of uh, stores and whether you want to get too much density in an area without that, but it can be served by by sewage, town sewage. So you could increase it maybe to RU40 or mix it up and and sort of have different areas in the in the property, different types of development. But I don't know what other whether we want to go around again or whether people have given it some more thought. But it sounds like there is some reluctance over changing the zoning from from the RU80. Yeah, I think I, I, spent, um, yeah, I spent some time, um, my favorite thing, the use table, and just going down um, what was actually feasible. <clears throat> Some of it I understand is conditional and all, but you know, they have entertainment or sports facilities, public recreation, adult daycare, child care, uh, kind, different kinds of care homes, hospital, emergency treatment center, medical, um, certainly some other um, type of, ma- you know, light manufacturing, active senior housing. Um, so I think there's a lot of choices, um, nursing facility, residential life. Um, so it's not like there are no choices in the RU80, and a lot of these choices would have put some of the you know, people interested in doing things in the last round. So um, I, I do think it's something to consider um, if, in fact, it isn't. I mean, it, it sounds by the name of it, it's going to be very restrictive, but in fact, it does allow for a lot of pretty large scale developments. Mm-hmm. Developments that you mean would require large, large acreage. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, I don't think it's good to just cram a lot of new housing in that area. Mm-hmm. Hmm? Right. It's not not realistic. Well, a company like uh, Precious Memories that you know was always expanding, they would love that. <laughs> hmm. Well, yeah, that's uh, maybe too much acreage. <laughs> yeah. But if you could have maybe some uh, recreational facilities, but I think we have to be careful that it's sort of at the edge of the town and hard to get people there. Hmm. It, if it's going to be a town-wide facility, it's probably better to have it more centrally located. I think I agree with that. I think the classic case is a swimming pool. Mm -hmm. We have so much critical mass now with the schools, the middle school, the high school, the senior center. Um, And then, of course, we have, I guess, a kind of a rec center. And there certainly are a lot of theaters around town or across the river, but either river. But um, I think, yeah, a pool would be a really nice idea. Um, but it's just, it would be the wrong place in my humble opinion. Well, it might cost more to rehab the pool than it would be to, say, put it in the old Fitch Junior High School building. Right, Ron, it's some piece of land the town has adjacent to some of these other stuff. Well, plus buildings. it has parking there, too. You know, and it might make more sense to, to look at the financial aspect of it. Especially if we're going to pay for it by TIF. I think this might be a case where 50 years from now, if we were to rehab that pool at great cost, you know, the pool in the next corner of town, a generation from now, people who hadn't attended this meeting would think, what the heck were we thinking when we put a, a pool at that corner when we've got, actually, we've got a dream situation with school mm-hmm. and administration center and playing fields in the center, in the absolute center of town right now. We've done a fantastic job of falling into that. Mm-hmm. And to say that this is just 
completely opposite of that. On the fringe. I, I would like to just, uh, Hal, I think you're absolutely on track. I, you know, just historically what we have struggled with on this mission for the longest time is defining Groton's downtown. We, we didn't have it, but it, it, but actually I think it's starting to happen and it, and we're, we know it. It's the area between the library and the, Top of Fort Hill and and the uh, town hall is beginning to actually look like the, uh, the center of our town, and then we have the shopping district. And I think that this kind of development would be, you know, that there was high density would be perfect in that area or where we, around the shopping centers. But it's, uh, I, I think what you, what you said before, Hal, was the, this creating of a new node. Which, and, and, uh, this idea of, I mean, this is the definition of sprawl to me. And I, I think that it's really trying to, um, create a part of town that, that wouldn't naturally occur unless we force it. It means it fails in 20 years. Well, I mean, the thing is, is that these kinds of things, I think that, you know, when you see parts of town that are so, so, so successful. Mm-hmm. Downtown Mystic. You know, it's that mixed use. No Ank Village. It's that mixed use. Hopefully someday Fame Street could come back. Those kinds of neighborhoods work, but I think for us to think that we're going to create that in a vacuum in the northeast part of the town is, you know, I, I don't know. These things don't happen because someone planned them. It's because people go where the things are, which is your things, Hal, there. I don't <laughs> You know, that's what. People want to live near the things. And for us to try to force this, I think, is a mistake. Yeah. No, Jeff, yeah. Can, I ask, can I ask you a question about the history of the marketing of the property? I don't know if that's a Deb or a John question. But I... What? Do we I, care? Yeah. I think we should not. I think we should... Not worry about the past, but where we go from today. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Well, I was just trying to um, just to see the what was built previously and why it was channeled to what we have right now down to this one developer. Um, I'm just uh, I'm just wondering if, if it was remarketed differently. Um, you know, would we get different results? <clears throat> I think we got a lot of different results and with some floor that uh, respond. <clears throat> we got some really different, some of them are very light adjustments to the property. I was, I was surprised to see that, but that was our business plan. Yeah. But Jeff, you've been pretty specific. This is about the MEC, it's not about the developer or everything else out there, mm-hmm. right? So it is a new That's slate, correct. it's a new slate for us. New slate. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we should just say we are where we are and right. look forward, not look in the past and not care about what happened. It, it, it's what's the place going to look like in 50 years. And I think why downtown Mystic survives is because of the bridge. And that's the only way to go east and west in the area. And that's why it got created, and and they had a commercial area there, you know, and, and why it survived. You know, it's like if you go look at, at Waterford and the mall, you know, 20 years ago, that was the latest thing. Now look at it. It's going to go to nothing. And they'll be bringing in the uh, building records or turn it into a condo development. Because it's not a natural location. There has to be something else that makes people want to want to be there or go through there. And with the waterways around here, where are bridges, you end up with population. I mean, that's where Old Mystic was originally it was built there because you, the water wasn't in, waterway wasn't an impediment to, to moving people. 
but it sort of sounds like the feeling of most people is that uh, not have a large development in the site. I agree. Hmm? I think it's unanimous. I think you have to crack. <laughs> I think we all crack something should go there. I think it should get filled up with something, but not stuffed to full. No, no, it, should, it shouldn't. Yeah, yeah, right. and, and to your point, one of the advantages we might actually have of we call it downtown, which is our commercial center, I'll call it between the grocery stores, is it actually funnels a lot of traffic from our industries. Let's go by how much traffic funnels through there, both from the housing standpoint and people getting off the highway and getting to where the housing is. It actually has a little bit, even, even without a train station, which still makes me crazy that we don't have a train station, but even without it, it funnels a lot of people through there. Therefore, it's handy, and it actually is an opportunity for something to happen, mm-hmm. as opposed to just being nearby a traffic exit, a highway exit. Actually, I would say being near a highway exit is a, you could call it an attribute, but I think it also is a is a way for people to just leave town. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, truthfully, when you head uh, north on I-95, the next exit is Stonington, right? Mm-hmm. You've left Groton. Yeah. And, uh, and heading south, you're, I don't, you know, I mean, certainly, I don't think the highway is the best way if you want people to, 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 the, to live and what, what is it? Let live and play and all this stuff. And drive. The highway isn't the way to get there. I personally don't enjoy driving on the highway. I try to avoid it, but I think it should be it, 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 this kind of, if you get a big development, it should be walkable. It should be bicycleable. It should be public transportation. And we're force, force feeding this thing, hoping that it'll, will grow. And I think that it, I don't think you want it to grow. (laughs) Well, it's just, just has some use. Yeah. Yeah. So, so an appropriate growth. Yeah. If anything, if we're trying to, and, and that's part of our overall plan is what the zoning does is it encourages development in some places and discourages overdevelopment in others. I think we're already there and putting something there is a place where we want to discourage overdevelopment. Mm-hmm. Want to add a mixture of 2,000 units between the grocery stores, I think it can handle it. But here, not so much. Not without altering the town <clears throat> In a very large way. Right. Because whatever way that is. All you're going to do is generate more traffic to, to either go to Staunton, to, to Big Y, or to McQuaid's, or down to the existing shopping areas in Crotton. Yeah. You know, go to Walmart's or out of the Big Y in that area. You know, the the other day I had to, I wanted to go to the Staples in in Westerly, and I hadn't been through that area for a long time, and I was surprised to see how much has grown up between, say, where you cross over the the, uh, bridge and uh, Akatuk to get down to where the the uh, airport road is where they have a lot of shopping is, but that whole area is really built up a lot. Uh, and that's sort of naturally developed. Interesting to see that. There isn't that much. I mean, I guess the business is in downtown Westerly are okay, but they don't seem to have a lot of, a lot of people or traffic, foot traffic there. Or it seems to be up on the one corridor. So I guess we're really saying that we really don't want to either change the RU80 or 
maybe make it slightly denser or do something and leave it as is, is what the bottom line is. I personally could see it being a little bit denser than the neighboring neighborhood. The neighborhoods around it are a little bit denser. Are you in Hawaii, I think, yeah. Right. And that, that's, if we want to keep things in keeping with the neighbors, then that's what it should be. The only reason it's very weighty is because it was empty. So. I was, yeah, and there was sort of discouragement of, of the properties along River Road, I think that's. Right. Hmm? And in this case, we can, we can maintain not doing anything anywhere near River Road or even on that hillside. No, it's all going to be open space. But just slightly more, a, a little tick up on the development level um, along Allen Street or Cow Hill. So that might be fine. I still need to find opinions, but from what I'm hearing from the neighbors, I didn't hear them having a, a terrible problem with that. A few people just said, just leave it alone. Mm-hmm. But uh, it would not necessarily change much. And I would say that 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 might be the case, given that it's sewered. You know, that the, the sewer have being sewered would allow for a little bit more density. But I think that also in the same that uh, the feeder roads to this area are are right dangerous. Cow Hill Road is is very dangerous, and I think that. Have to be very careful about you know how much density is up there because it's going to mean uh, enormous improvements and expense to the town if if those feeder roads need to be improved. Unless that might be a good use of TIF for that really. Well, Cow Hill Road to the north of the property is terrible. Cow Hill Road south from. I think it's just from the well. The, those intersections are are a, would be a big concern. Oh, that, that's yes. The intersection, right, the intersection, yeah, the okay. intersection around the highway is already hard, so we're already looking into that. I understand. And that's I already made. A I point. think it's the, from the firehouse to Oral Oral School Road, where you go over that blind hill. Right. That that's uh, that's you know, right. is really uh, a choke point. Yeah, Mike, I, I knew, uh, I, my good friend was the previous owner of the Adams house and standing in his driveway and he was backing out and a car slammed into him. Yeah. Because he was coming up that hill so fast and he came over to rise and boom. Well, the road there is just about as narrow as can be. And I, I believe also that, I mean, there's ledge in that area too. So I, that's what that hill is. It's all, you know, I don't know. I would be a little bit, I could see more density up there because they're sewer, but I also think that it, that it, if there was, it would just be a little bit because, uh, you're talking about an area of town that, that hasn't developed, and I think for a reason. Jeff, do we have to, um, give a redirect to our consultant who's writing words? Probably as we speak. Well, I assume that's what the outcome of what we're doing tonight. Well, yeah. it, you know, so this is John, just jumping in for a second. Right now, it's just Deb, myself, Paige, no consultants of the towns are advising or sitting on this meeting right now. We're trying to get a gauge of where we go. Um, I, I think a lot of what I've gotten tonight is without a change to the POCD, the commission is not looking for any drastic changes to the zoning. Um, there might be some sense of changing it down to RU40, but even that, I'm not sure. We really, just a couple folks have spoken about that. And you know, one of the potential option or path we could go on that we had discussed 12, 18 months ago was modifying the institutional reuse zoning text as it related to this, pro- this property or just in general. That was a section of the zoning regulations that did not get to when we did the larger rewrite, there might be some applicability there, but I'm also not hearing a lot of census from the commission that, or I think I heard it pretty loud and clear that those buildings aren't really that important to the commission members. 
though I don't know how important the institutional reuse would really be because the main purpose of that is salvaging and saving the older buildings. When they had that tour, it, lo- it looks like they're not very useful interior-wise. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think they'd be very expensive to, mm-hmm. to make them useful. In all ways. I mean, just one is that it would just be so costly to use, but just the layout of them and the fact that it, everything is a half a floor up or half a floor down, there really is... Nothing that really can, it really lends itself to a, a really good redevelopment. At least at the uh, Velvet Mill, it was on on ground level, and it works for a commercial. This is doesn't have anything like that. Well, too, we just you know with the building of the new schools. I mean, I could the West Side School here in the in in the city. Seemed to me like it wasn't that bad of a building. You know, and it, it could have been worked with, but it proved that it wasn't. And, and even a building that was in good as condition as the West Side School, which was, you know, occupied right up until the wrecking ball hit it. Uh, these buildings have been neglected for a long time. And I think that you're, I, I mean, I just don't know how, how they could be saved. Maybe they can be, but I, I think that it, from what I've what I've seen in, with, in town with the schools that we rebuild, it's very infrequent that uh, trying to repair buildings that have been neglected like that for as long as they have is cost effective. I, but I don't know. You know, maybe someone could tell me otherwise, but I don't. I don't know how that works and how those buildings work. They, they weren't designed for. They were designed for small classrooms, you know. When you go through them, that's what they are. And then you're altering masonry buildings, which are in poor condition. Dormitories. Yeah, mills have a lot of open space, so you can do a lot in interior with them. Different kind of building. Hmm? Yeah. It was a different kind of building. And they're sturdy, too, because they're yeah. built for heavy loads. But oh, you know, a lot of times adaptive reuse of buildings, it, they're always a little kind of weird and funky. Um, you know, like the co-work space, the R&D, those types of things. But, uh, again, it depends on what the commission's looking for up there. It's going to be very expensive to, to develop this area. Either if you either have to rehab the buildings or tear them down, What's the problem with the cleaning up the uh, waste area? There is no hazardous waste left. All the hazardous uh, material has been removed. I think it has to be cleaned up, doesn't it? The buildings still need to be remediated, and there, I believe, are still some waste issues um, in relation to the dumping grounds that were on the property. So there, yeah. there's still a substantial yeah. amount of cleanup that needs to happen on the property. And, and depending on which way you go, if you want to remove the buildings, the cost of removing those is going to be substantial. And, and that, that's one of the tricky parts with this property. You know, I don't know if people have been um, watching some of the news. It's been getting vandalized, graffiti. There's a lot of very unsavory things happening on that property right now. And some development of it, which is going to have a cost of cleanup associated with it, in a number I, I don't even want to put an estimate on right now, but it's going to be, you know, many millions of dollars. But that's something that has to get paid for somewhere. Whatever you do with it, it's, you know, the starting cost is going to be high. It could be higher than what the value of the property is. You know. Well, that's probably why the one dollar selling the building for selling property for a dollar is probably the correct price. But it's really several millions of dollars. Well, many millions of dollars. I mean, yes, the knock, and then I always say it's expensive knockdown building, but a lot of that just has to do with the, the cleanup work. But it has to be cleaned up whether you knock it down or not. But that part doesn't matter. Because, I don't know. 
one reinforced base or he comes down pretty easily actually. I don't know how much that should influence our, you know, how we decide the zoning part of it. Because, you know, I mean, that's not my purview is to determine whether those buildings are reusable or not. It's up to the developer. Yeah, no, he that's it. allow it if he wants yeah, to. I think that what we, we need to focus on you know, what want. our job in the but zoning. And I think that if the buildings can be reused uh, or uh, repurposed, great. If they need to come down. And that, you know, either way, but I think that we have to recognize uh, Reiner's uh, point that it, something hopefully should happen because they're not safe at, at this point. But I, I don't know how we do that as a zoning commission. I don't think we can. We can just. Well, by, by zoning, we could establish. encourage keeping the building, but I'm not hearing that any of us thinks that there's any value to that. Well, I wouldn't want to mandate it either. Uh, it, 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 but even to encourage it, and I don't think we should encourage it. Because I don't think we care if that building stays. Oh, no, I, I certainly don't. Uh, any, uh, you know, it, it should be up to the developer to analyze. Yeah. Say, so, yeah. use for it. I, I would just kind of. Uh, I've been trying not to say too much, but just listen to the commission during this. But demolition costs are a huge part. Property feasibility, and that's something that we really should be looking at, thinking about a future use on this property because it's going to be a different property redevelopment. So it's, you know, the, the joint roles of the commission are, you know, the planning and the zoning. The zoning can help enable and encourage, but we have to come up with a long-term plan for the site that will help those build. If you don't want those buildings to be preserved, then what can the commission do? through your functions as planning and zoning to help enable those buildings coming down that doesn't cost the taxpayers millions and millions of dollars. So that, that's the tricky part here. And and I don't have a great solution for you, but I, I think that's part of the what you've been tasked with grappling. Yeah, but that's got to be a develop, developer cost to determine that. If he wants to go estimate. I I mean, we don't have the ability to estimate that. Well, no, but think, you want to enable the buildings to actually get, if, if we you're allow the reuse of them, if they can be reused. Yes. Well, there were you know, there were three other people who bid on doing something at that property. It's not like there was just one person, and they were bidding on what was there and knew what they were facing. So. But what, yeah, it's not like everybody ran away. But what they were bidding on was keeping the building. Mm-hmm. They weren't. They weren't short being said. What it, here's my options. What's it cost to keep it, as opposed to what's it cost to not keep it? It was probably the more expensive option to, to rehab it. I think so. It usually is. We did yeah. briefly talk about those two other proposals at the town council meeting last week. We gave them a little bit of an update on things and overview. And Paige could certainly speak to these a lot better than me. But the two other proposals that came in were not viable projects. That was something that was discussed. Nor, I mean, one of them required substantial changes to state law. The town purchasing utilities on a long-term basis. There, there were a lot of assumptions that didn't work with it. And the other project didn't have really a lot of details, and it didn't seem like a feasible developer moving forward. The developer that was chosen was chosen by the state as someone that could feasibly take a development project forward, not necessarily the development that they were proposing. So I don't want to get too much about it. I think every time we rehash, oh, what about these two other people? The current person has an option on the property from the state. They are for all practical purposes the owner. But we're also not trying to create zoning for a particular person. The point I'm trying to bring up is that if we don't create zoning or have zoning that enables for some development to happen at all, because if the demolition cost of taking those buildings down far exceeds the value of the land, the, build, the land is going to stay in the state that it is. Those buildings will continue to be vandalized until someone 
some entity, the town, the state, others, need to knock down those buildings. That's the point I was trying to make, that if the zoning doesn't enable and the planning for that doesn't enable there to be enough profit made to take the buildings down, then without subsidy, the buildings will remain. But right now, we only had a comparison of making it financially feasible to keep the buildings. Mm. And we never examined about knocking them down. Mm. And from our experience with the schools, as it was just mentioned, it came as a surprise to me, and I'm, I'm, I should be, have, know better, that it was financially better off to knock down these usable buildings. That's right. An unusable building. It probably, it might be cheaper to just knock it down and have a flat piece of land with a basement. And in all those instances, you know, to take down Sealy, it was about a million dollars and that or more. And that made sense because then they're proposing, you know, multifamily housing. The 20,000 square foot-ish building, I think on this site, we're looking at about 160,000 square feet of building. So a little different order of magnitude. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But we should, we should allow either one to happen. That's right. It's got to be up to the developer to determine does he have use for the building and it's cost effective or not. And I don't think we should care. We shouldn't prohibit it or try to make it go one way or the other because that's, that's only a cost thing or the, or the town might lose revenue for taxes or you have to use TIF for it or something like that. It would have been nice to have an order of magnitude estimate done just to know what's it cost to rehab the building order of magnitude compared to what's it cost to knock it down and just have the land available to build a heck of a lot more on it. But that would have been a nice thing to have in our, in our pocket so we know what to, to aim for. Not having that, I just have to say I agree with you, Jeff, is that we have the developer. We don't want to encourage him or discourage him to do either one. Mm -hmm. But we may help with marketing to have an idea, independent assessment of what it would cost to knock things down. Right. So for me, it's kind of like you know the um, plan of conservation. Well, this is just another plan that we need in order um, for the town to make the decision. And without that. <clears throat> I think as Jeff and everyone else has articulated, we're not going to offer up anything restrictive. We're going to be open to what potentially is there, but we should not define that job. You know, that needs to be the town and the citizens. We need to get that number. Well, just like the planet con con conservation. You're on the PLCD, Kevin. <laughs> That's the planning part. <laughs> I get that. Okay. But, but the, but the cost of, of an action, Jeff, if that becomes part of the decision, you, we need to capture that, right? Well, us. The town needs to capture that so that some, we're not getting in this argument whether we should be doing something that potentially could facilitate without that number first being um, viewed. I think, Kevin, I think you're onto something in that I think the more information that we can give a potential developer or the developer would be, and that would include uh, what the zoning is there yes, and, and whether or not those buildings that are there need to be saved. You know, if, if uh, you know, someone can come up with costs for either one way or the other or a developer can come up with it, I think the more information that it could be provided, the better choices we're going to have. It's just at this point, I feel like there's so many unknowns, it's hard for me to feel like I'm uh, being forced to make these decisions. <laughs> well, the only decision we would make is is what we want to allow, not well, mandate, but allow for development. Yeah, I think we're hearing it. I think a lot of the things that you said, Jeff, 
you know, and, and maybe even if the property were, were, uh, broken up in some way or defined differently, so it doesn't all have to be the same. You know, maybe there is room. I mean, we are building a lot of apartments in town and, uh, that creates a lot of density and I, I don't know if we want that kind of density in this area. Maybe there could be some single family or two family homes in that area. Maybe some of this uh, institutional, you know, the things that, that we were discussing, but I don't think it all has to be the same. Right. No, I, and, the, I, I, and the property to the, but, you know, I mean, it certainly doesn't all have to be the same. No, you could subdivide the property up into different uses, yeah. different areas. Hmm? One thing that it, it, it might be the only takeaway that I got from uh, a, a very positive thing from the Rensselaer thing was the idea of doing a better connection to Cow Hill. I care where it is. He had, they had one particular plan. It doesn't need to be there. As long as it's south of the fire department, anywhere along there, that changes the feel of what can go in there. That's instant subdivision capability and takes the weight off of Worry about Laurel School Road being the feeders. Now that Cal Hill becomes something pretty normal, and you can put a lot of traffic on there. The road is plenty wide enough south of the uh, of the uh, fire station. Traffic lights are already in place. Still don't want to put too many there. But I still think we should do something to fix exit 89 or exit 89. But it. Uh, that pretty much bi- can bisect the whole property into some pieces that can be used better mm-hmm. and have a better route to the oral school itself. Well, that, that could be, but the only, I mean, the issue there is that once again, it leads, all roads lead to the highway. That's true. And, and then, I mean, if, if we want this kind of development or any development up there to benefit, I mean, I, I would like to see something up there if it's going to benefit downtown Mystic. I don't want to see it take away. I think that that's what, that this is going to take away from downtown Mystic in, in making the parking situation worse because any development up there is going to mean jumping in your car to get to downtown Mystic. It's not practical to think that people are going to walk from there or, or even to ride a bicycle. It's just not going to happen. No. And so, the other option then is a big part of whatever we put up there is going to be getting on the highway and then we have no control over where they go. Mm-hmm. You know, if you've got an area that's got restaurants already or shopping, that's where you, I mean, that's what I think from a planning point, that's where you want to put this kind of development. Mm-hmm. You know, where it can be Accelerated. Yeah, it's it's that you don't have to build all of these other things. If it's slow development, it's not going to have a significant impact. And so that's why I'm I'm thinking, you know, the density should, or the, you know, the R, are you 80? Maybe a little bit less. But I don't see it coming down so much that that we're. Um, Making the situation worse for the rest of the town. No, you don't. Yeah. Hmm? Sprawl. Maybe the yeah, RU40 um, would be the lowest you'd want to go. Yeah. Maybe have a lot of open space to. Well, or, or, or uh, you know, open space development kind of a thing, you know, where maybe yeah. you could. Yeah. yeah, you could use open space development. Yeah. So, so the developer, but that would certainly be a good. Use and try to leave as much as open space as you can have. I think we all, hmm? all prefer seeing open space development seem to work much better. Hmm? Always big on open space development is just a better, better use of property. I, mean, I wasn't suggesting bringing that extra connection off of Dow Cal Hill to help increase density. I'm still talking the same density. Well, you still may need that, yeah. Uh, but you still might need that. Whatever you do there, Anything we add to that area, well, I think the school route is not a great way to get there. So I think that's still. No, I think you'd have, you, you should be realistic to accept a 
do a change to allow that to happen right mm-hmm. as part of the development. Makes a lot of sense, really. really. It does. Mm-hmm. It does. Yeah, I agree. It would improve the development. That's correct. Without increasing or having unusual to density increase. I don't know if anybody has any any new info decisions or if we want to. Do you have enough input, John, to understand what the feeling of the commission is? Um, a, a little bit. I mean, I think what I'm hearing right now is either we go down a course of a POCD change, which is a much larger community-driven initiative, and I think that's kind of one potential direction. The other is look at our existing zoning. Is it are you right now? It's are you 80? Is it are you 40 or are you 20? Because it has sewers there now. And as part of that zone change, I know uh, hearing definitely some infrastructure improvements that people would like to see, such as roadway improvements. The connection to Cow Hill was something that was incredibly expensive. There might be some cheaper ways of doing that, of improving existing roadways. Um, I, I think that's the general direction that I'm here. Um, if we, yeah, if we call that, I don't know that we need a POCD change for. No, if we go that route. But, you know, we really can't require offsite improvements as part of a zone pain. So that's one of the, the tricky parts. Mm-hmm. When folks are talking about being through to have a better connection at Cow Hill. So that's, uh, that, that is one of the, you know, one of the reasons looking Something broader in the floating zone with some of the improvements for offsite improvements. Special permits allow us to do that a little bit with some offsite improvements, but that is somewhat limited. I think even if the commission, again, general direction I'm getting tonight, maybe an RU40, maybe an RU20, how do we how do we move that forward, or do you just look to the developer to make that level of application? Right now, they are the developer. They are the property owner. If that's the consensus you're looking to go, you know, maybe the ball's getting put in their court. I move this forward. The town was taking a lead on if there was a crafting of a new zoning regulation, but if the commission doesn't want to go in that direction and and doesn't want to amend the institutional reuse, then I think it's pretty clear how it goes. And and it's a yeah, we would entertain the. uh, don't request for zoning change yeah. to density. Hmm? Yeah. Maybe that's the best way to handle it. But again, to reiterate what Don said, you would have to feel comfortable that the infrastructure that's in place would support that zone change. Right. You mm-hmm. can't require a widening of Kyle well, Hill Road. Oh, no. I, well, okay. Yeah. Hmm? I, yeah. But that, if we were would require the widening of the road unless the town did it. it would, the developer would have to bear the cost. And now, if you change the zone, you are acknowledging that the infrastructure oh, is there to support there. that no, zone. No, I understand that. We have to accept it, right? This, this not accept the zoning change because there is no. Mm-hmm. Correct. You know, we're certainly not looking for a, a vote tonight, but it would be great to have um, maybe a little bit of a head nod, ex- acknowledgement, or a no if people, okay, out of the synopsis that we just gave back, putting the ball back in the developer's court, the, the property owner, that what the commission is looking for is, you know, kind of what I had summed up, or let them take a stab at it themselves. I think I would like to see what those – but the, what kind of density those kinds of zoning changes would would make? Um, you know, if if it remained at R, are you eighty? What are we talking up there? Are you forty? What are we talking? Are you twenty? What are we talking? I mean, how many buildings? And, how many well, buildings? yeah. I mean, what what you know? I think we're talking about density, traffic, if, households. If However, right. those things translate. If it's RU80, that's 20 
you have to put 20 houses, approximately. You'd have to subtract the open space, 10 per, take 10% more. So it would be a little less than 18. I guess it would come out to about 18 houses. And those would all be analyses that we would look to have the property owner do. We, oh, yeah. You know, but that's so approximately what we're talking about. Double that if you want to argue 20. I mean, argue 40. So that, that's a propensity. Maybe get on. Yeah. What's the zoning of Ledgeland right now? Ledgeland Drive? Um, uh, oh, God. It it's is. That's RU20. Yeah, it's RU20. The rest of Field Crest Area is RS12. Ledgeland is RU20. I think the, the thing that kept Ledgeland not seem particularly dense was the terrain. Limited how easy it was to to uh, put houses in there. Or were flat, and you could put a grid that, that would be a lot more dense. Mm-hmm. That was also an open space subdivision, so we got a bit of open space out of that. Right. And if you have an open space subdivision, then you could pick the area you wanted to actually have the construction take place. Make it easier. Well, that, that would seem like the way to go up there and complement the open space that's already up there. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I, I don't know if you have some of the places in town that, you know, Bluff Point is, is heavily used. I mean, that, there is a uh, Haley Farm, same thing. The, these kinds of areas are in demand. Mm-hmm. And it's what makes living in Groton great. You know, it's we've got something that a lot of towns don't have. Yeah. A lot of trouble. Mm-hmm. Protect it at some level. Mm-hmm. It looks like the area between Oral School Road and Cow Hill even where Cahill is already also R- RU20 right now. I mean, R20. Mm-hmm. That's right. So it's already good to go, R20. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, so maybe it's a, it's R20, or maybe the mix is what makes more sense, is that we already have oral school to Cahill being R20, and if it's uh, R40, where east of Oral School Road, what did it out about there? Mm-hmm. It'll add quite a bit because we already, this doesn't make much of a change. It certainly would blend with what you have because so much you already have, it just isn't built out. And if in fact you wanted to develop the area between Cow Hill and Oral School Road, if you were a smart developer to put it in there, you'd have to put in a road. Mm-hmm. It's the way to develop it. Work for Ledgeland. What are, what are you thinking now? Are, are you 20? I'm thinking west of... It already is our 20. Yeah, yeah, no, no, yeah, no, I realize that. That's, and that's actually maintain that. Then R forty on the other side, where the main, main property. Right. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't seem like that much of a change. It would still be less dense on the other side. How many houses or units that would put on Oral School Road, which I'm still not crazy about, but I'm sure it's open to the idea that that allows development at the R twenty level between mm-hmm. Oral School Road and Cow Hill which would mandate if we put any kind of road structure in there, that it would connect. Let's go.
but it sort of sounds like we have a consensus then. Would the institutional sort of stuff still be allowed in the RU40? It's, 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 it's limited to the items that Sue had called out. You know, there are daycares that are allowed, yeah, yeah. Um, assisted living. Um, there are some things by special permit that are allowed in the RU zone. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's, you know, I didn't think there was much of a change, though, by the size of the, the zone. You know, the table just calls out RU. It's allowed in the oh, RU. I saw that it was broken without down. regard to 2048. Yeah, you know, I thought it was even broken down. Yeah, that's right. It's just RU. So it doesn't make any difference what the size of the lots are. So I think. I guess we have a, a sort of consensus of that. Does that answer your questions, John? Or do you want? No, I, I think that's good. Oh, is there any reason to have another workshop? Or we, I think we're done with the workshops. I think you're done with the workshops for now. I don't know if the developer wants to meet with us sometime or not. I, I, I think they certainly would. I don't know what the, the right venue, if, uh, if it's a workshop, if it's a regular meeting. You know, I know as a property owner and um, having the option on the property, they certainly want to discuss some options for the development there. So, you know, that's something that they wanted to meet with the commission. Whether you wanted to do that in a workshop format, uh, at a regular meeting, when you wanted to do it, whether you wanted to do it this Thursday night and get some feedback from them, or if you wanted to do it um, sometime in the future. I don't know if it's a good idea to do it in a workshop, or we should just. They it would seem like that would be a little premature. I think anybody would want to think about, you know, if a developer is going to come up with some ideas well, or some. I don't think. This went this Thursday. It would be no, that wouldn't seem uh, no. pr practical. I would think they we, they could come to us uh, at a regular meeting presentation. Okay. Mm -hmm. But too quickly, then the presentation will be trying to talk us out of this. Yeah, I'd have a presentation where they can say, "Here's what that would look like. Here's what I would then propose, or something like that." Based on what we're coming, what we think we're coming up with, not trying to come up with the reasons why we should come up with something else. I think as public as it could be, as Jeff indicates, in in one of our normal meetings, would more would be much more appropriate. Well, I, yeah, hmm? not a workshop. No, I, I I don't think it's right in a workshop. If they had an application with us. That would that's be right. It has to be well, I, yeah, I think that Kyle, Kyle, you've got a point that brings back Star Street when you, you know, and you, you, I know that you've predicted that on other applications is that sometimes things don't uh, end up looking like you had hoped. And I think, I, and, and I, I think we want to avoid that. You know, where you're given the worst case. It's a workable site. It's just a matter of, you know, can it work within the constraints of what Groton needs? I don't think it, yeah, if it's low density, it's not going to have that much impact on the community. But I think it'll be appropriate. No, it has. like it would be appropriate no, for no, that area. It's not damaging, I guess. It's maybe it doesn't have a negative impact. Which overdevelopment could be. I think we should do it at a regular meeting. 
presentation and no decision. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no presentation and no decision. Yeah, okay. but it would be different if they had an application. I I don't have a problem with trying to work on something like that. Once they have an application. All right. So, if no one does, anyone have anything else to bring up, or any other thoughts? No, you, you ran it well, Jeff. I think then, then we can uh, adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Make a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay. Different outcome than what I expected. Thank you all. Thank you. Please. All right. Thank you all. Hey, good progress. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Bye.